pray, amen. Amen. Awesome. If you're still writing your goal, that's all good. We're going to get into the service. Who was here last week? Last week was dark. Last week we looked at Psalm 88 that ends with this line uh, that says, Darkness is my closest friend. And everyone cheered in that moment too. But it taught us that at times periods of darkness can last a long time. And also that when we are feeling lost, we can talk to Jesus. That we can actually worship him even with our despair. We said that prayers in the dark are more victorious than they look. That actually as we come to God, even if we don't see the result we hoped for, even if we don't see the result that we expected, that the enemy can be defeated. What does it look like? It looks like having a rhythm of prayer. It looks like bringing all of our reality to God. And it looks like recognizing Jesus as King, as Lord. Today, you can breathe. We're not looking at some dark psalm about suffering and pain. We're looking at Psalm 67 this morning, a psalm of blessing. Remember, we're talking about prayer, which we've said all along is just talking to Jesus. And if you're new to church this morning, if you are new to faith this morning, you might think that there's a special way to talk, a special posture or a special kind of voice. Let me tell you, there's not. Yes, there is wisdom. Yes, there is scripture that shows us patterns and supports and guides us. But prayer is simply talking to Jesus. Let none of that stuff get in the way of you saying, God, help me. God, I need you in my life. I need your support with me and my family throughout this week. God, speak to me and then listen. Simple prayers that will transform your life. Our prayer is that through this collection of talks, you might begin to talk to Jesus. Maybe for some of you, would you open up your heart to him for the first time? For others, that you would stay the course, that you would keep going, keep talking to him. And for some, that you would begin to talk to Jesus more. In Psalm 67, verse 1, we read, May God be gracious to us and bless us, make his face shine on us. In some of your Bibles, it'll finish with another word, Selah. Salah. I don't know how to pronounce it. A lot of the Bible, it's taken out. It's this Hebrew word that's a, a musical term that really the definition is slightly unknown. But most scholars believe it means pause, stop, reflect. And so I'm going to pause, stop, and reflect before we move on to the next six verses in this psalm and discover what the psalmist really means when he says, May God be gracious to us and bless us. Make his face shine on us. This is a direct quote from Numbers 6 and the story of Aaron and Moses. And actually it is God speaking to Moses, telling him about how to bless the people of Israel. In Numbers 6 verse 22, we read, The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the, the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. No, it's not the lyrics of the song, The Blessing. It comes from Numbers chapter 6. And it's abbreviated in Psalm 67, but it's this beautiful prayer of blessing. It's beautiful. But you know, it's also a radical prayer. It's actually a radical prayer if you think about it. The Lord be gracious to us. Some translations say the Lord have mercy on us. God have mercy on me. And God bless me. God have mercy on me and God bless me. Can you imagine walking into a king and saying, please have mercy on me. Don't kill me. 
I know at times in my life I didn't even believe you existed and I haven't followed all of your commands. Please have mercy on me. Awesome. Can you also, I need a little bit of finances for my mortgage, help with the kids, maybe a cleaner over the house. I just need, would you mind blessing me too? You'd get thrown out of the room, wouldn't you? You could never interact with a king like this. And yet, this is what we discover in this scripture. I want to ask the question, who's special in this scenario? Am I the special one or is the king? It's the king. That he would be so confident in his creation, in salvation, who he is, his might and his power, that my cheeky request for mercy and blessing isn't a sign of his weakness, but rather his unconditional, great and unsearchable love. He is gracious and merciful and both together in their fullness. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us. In those Middle Eastern systems, if someone wanted to seek the audience of the monarch or the the king, they would enter his presence and it would be the king's facial expressions alone that would say whether they could come or whether they had to go. A turn of the nose and they're out. A smile and they're in. And the psalmist here, he approaches God as this king and calls calls him to shine his face upon him, which just means to be pleased with him, to invite him into his presence. You've got to know this morning that the greatest blessing that we could ever receive from our God is that the creator of the heavens and the earth would be pleased with us, that he would actually invite us and welcome us into his presence. And it's not just for the pastors. It's not just for the ones that show up to church every week. It's for everyone. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. We are his children. We are, as they say in church throughout the years, blessed and highly favored. We are blessed. You are blessed. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are blessed. Say it like you mean it. They might not believe you. We are blessed. And it's only till we come to the understanding that we are blessed that we can move on to verse 2. Because verse 2 begins with this, So that, so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all the nations. Why are we so richly blessed? Why is our God a God of grace and mercy? So that. So that his ways, so that his word, so that his kingdom, so that his salvation, so that the name of Jesus would be known throughout the entire earth. So that the name of God would be praised among all the nations. Your kingdom come here as it is in heaven. Sometimes I wonder if we leave God hanging. He's reaching out for the high five. Maybe he's more of a fist pump guy. I picture God as a fist pump guy. We're praying these prayers. Lord, bless me, bless me, bless me. And he's waiting, he's waiting to agree for the, so that I may let your name be known among all the nations. It's been said many times in church before, but the truth remains the same. We are blessed to be a blessing. We are blessed to be a blessing. I've got time on my hands. Well, maybe I could have coffee with that person that everyone else thinks is is too much effort. I'm blessed with finances and a, 
a small mortgage, or maybe I could buy that meal for that family, invest in that uh, project. I'm blessed with a seat in my car. Someone say, amen, I'm blessed with fuel in my car. Or it's out of my way, but maybe I could take you home. I'm blessed to be a blessing. So that. Uh, Tim Keller says, we must not take credit for our own blessings, but point beyond ourselves to God. And the psalmist moves on in verse 3. He says, may the peoples praise you. God, may all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. And after verse 4 comes another one of these silas, pause, reflect. You can kind of feel the excitement of the psalmist here in wanting to see the whole earth come to know how good God is, how he's full of mercy, how he's full of grace, the God whose love is deep and wide, that's unconditional. The God who we now know on the other side of the cross would send his own son to die for you and I. Let me ask you, have you ever been so excited about something that you can't help but tell people about it? Do you know what I'm talking about? Or maybe you know that person in your life. Everything is the best. Do you know what I'm talking about? They know the best food, the best songs. They know the best place to buy the couch that you're looking for and they don't even need. Do you know what I'm talking about? I've got a friend who's just like this. He actually, he just says everything's the best. Every time I spend time with him, I wonder, is there anything? that maybe is second rate or second hand, but no, he knows everything is the best. And this friend of mine, he manages a restaurant in town, you might know, called Wood and Stone. It's the best, apparently. I have a photo of their menu actually up here. And uh, uh, one time I went through it with Josh, who's sitting over there, and I asked him, what would you recommend on this menu? And then I spent 10 minutes of my date with my wife as he walked through every single one of the items and said, cured salmon eggs Benedict, the best. Smashed avo breakfast, the best. Poached fruits granola bowl, the best. And then I get down to the additions, add an egg, the best. Heirloom tomatoes, the best. Are you following me? It's the best. And I want to pause and reflect and say, I, I really do love wood and stone, and it is the best. But I think the reason that Josh is such an advocate for, well, everything, <laughs> is because there's something that exists in all of us that if we truly enjoy something, we instinctively want to praise it to others. And it's actually in the praising to others that the joy is completed. You see, I think there's a little bit of Josh in all of us. We want others to see the beauty that we see. And it's the cry of the psalmist here as well. He says, may the peoples praise you. God, may the nations be glad and sing for joy. And so what does that say about the way that we talk to Jesus? Remember, we're talking about prayer. It means that true enjoyment of God should always lead to mission, to wanting others to see the beauty that we see. So number one, are you praying for your friends and family? Are you praying for your friends and family that they might come to see the beauty that you see, God, I pray for my hairdresser right now. The man who asks me about church every time I sit down in that chair. Lord, may he come to know the mercy and the grace and the goodness of you. But also, are you praying for our city? Are you praying for our city? The psalmist, he, he says he wants the equity and the joy of the nations of all the earth 
Isn't that the cry of the church of Jesus Christ? We want a multi-ethnic, international church of worshipers and world of justice. But we aren't there yet. And it's not something we can just post about caring on Instagram. It's something that we need to be on our knees beside our bed at night praying for. I'm not satisfied with middle class white church. Sorry. Uh, there's more people that need to be in this place. I want to see more First Nations representation in our church. More of our Filipino community. More of those who live on the canals and live in green fields or in some place, whatever. I don't care. It's not about being some sort of woke church, whatever that means. It's about the heart of our God. And so I'm praying for it that we would see all the people in our city come to know and praise our God. Why? Because true enjoyment of God must lead naturally to mission, to wanting others to see the beauty that we see. What if we got a little bit of Josh in all of us when it came to Jesus and the church? Hey, we aren't perfect here at East Lake, but this place is the best. You got to come. Are you going to that church over there? That is the best. Hey, you got to know a life surrendered to Jesus is the best. Verse 5 repeats again. I feel like Josh might have written this psalm. He comes again and says, May the peoples praise you. It's such a point that he wants to say, God, may all the peoples praise you. It's the cry of his heart because it's the heart of our God. The land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. To fear God is not simply to cower like there's a big, mean, dictator bully, but also that we would be in reverence and fear. I say also because sometimes we soften this word fear in church. No, we should have no fear of condemnation of some big bully dictator, but there is a healthy amount of fear that says God is all-powerful and mighty. But you know, if you're in total fear of something, it's very hard to be in fear of something else. Lee is petrified of magpies. She's told a story a few weeks back. I think she used the language that she had a fatal swooping accident. No one died. I just want you to know that (laughs) in the making of that story. But I remember being on the phone to Lee as this magpie for the first time in her life swooped her. And ever since, she's been totally afraid of all birds. I don't understand the logic. But, you know, she's so afraid of these magpies that we were in this rhythm of going for runs at lunchtime and staying fit. She is in no fear of being unfit or unhealthy anymore. The last few months, magpie season, we weren't allowed to go for a jog or I had to go on my own despite telling her that there were no magpies on this route. She's not afraid of the oncoming traffic. She flees that bird. There's no fear for cars. She's not afraid of looking after our kids, if I'm honest. It's every man for himself. She's so petrified by these magpies that her fear for the bird outweighs everything else. And the prayer of this final verse is that the whole earth would come to fear our God. And I wonder if sometimes as Jesus followers, we could lean into this a little bit more. If God, in whom we trust, who is all-powerful, merciful, gracious, magnificent, has delighted in us, has shone His face upon us, has blessed us by His grace, then shouldn't that remove all of our fear and our apathy as well so that we can speak 
of the glory and the goodness of God. It moves us to pray, make me a witness. Make me a witness. God, I'm scared people won't like me. God, I'm scared people are going to laugh at me. God, I'm scared that that SMS saying I'm praying for you is going to be miscommunicated and I won't have any friends anymore. Increasingly, God, I'm scared that I'm not going to be able to, as a Jesus follower, get the job that I had hoped for because I'm a Christian. God, I'm scared, but Lord, but Lord, but Lord. You are so much greater than my fear. And ultimately, Lord, I place my trust in you. I'm determined, God. Make me a witness. Maybe you're new to church this morning and you're like, this isn't for me. He's talking about telling others about Jesus and I'm not sure if I even know them yet. Let me tell you, the new Christians are the better ones. They are. It's true. Because we don't need to overcomplicate this stuff. It just sounds like I once was blind, but now I see. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once felt dead, but now I am alive. This is what my life looked like before Jesus. And this is what my life looks like now. You see, the greatest gift. The greatest gift we could ever receive is that God, our creator, would shine his face on us. That he would be pleased with us. But you have to know this morning that it's got nothing to do with you. It's got nothing to do with anything you have done. It's got nothing to do with how regularly you come to church. It's got everything to do with what Jesus Christ did for us. The good news about Jesus is not behave and be saved. The good news about Jesus is believe and receive. His death and resurrection for you, his gift of salvation for you, is an invitation for us all. And so as Kim comes up and jumps on those keys again, I want to read this scripture. And then I want to pray a prayer with you all, a prayer of of blessing. But my hope in in reading through Colossians 3, verses, chapters, chapter 3, verses 1 to 17, that you would just take a moment to pause and reflect. That you'd put aside your distraction, boredom, apathy, whatever it is, to take a moment with God right now. I'd encourage you to bow your head. Close your eyes and just reflect on the word of God. We read Colossians 3 verse 1. says, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all of His glory. So put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust and evil desires. Don't be greedy. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshipping the things of this world. Because of these things, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still a part of this world. But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behaviour, slander and dirty language. Don't put on your new nature. Don't lie to each other. For you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him. In this new life, 
It doesn't matter if you are Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters. And He lives in all of us. Since God chose you to be the holy people He loves, you must close your, clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom He gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. Dear Jesus, I know that I am blessed to be a blessing. May my friends, may my family, may this city come to know You. Make me a witness. May God be gracious to us and bless us. And make His face shine on us so that Your ways may be known on earth, Your salvation among the nations. May the peoples praise You. God, may all the peoples praise You. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Amen. Amen. The team are going to come up.